Welcome to the Topico Online Policy Seminar Tops. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Si Shang, a tobacco control researcher at Ohio State University. Tops is being organized by myself, Catherine McLean from Temple University, Mike Pasco at Georgia State University, and Justin White at the University of California, San Francisco. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with the presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Justin White at UCSF to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Today, we launch our fall 2021 season with a workshop presentation by Dr. Robert West, a professor emeritus of health psychology at University College London. His talk is titled, Conducting, Reporting, and Interpreting Randomized Trials in the Field of Tobacco Control, Prob Problems and Solutions. Uh, Dr. West specializes in addiction and uh, behavior change. He helped to create the blueprint for the UK's National Network of Stop Smoking Services and acts as an advisor to government on behavior change. He's authored more than 900 scientific articles, as well as several books, including Theory of Addiction, The Smoke-Free Formula, the Behavior Change Wheel, and Energize the Secrets of Motivation. Our discussant today is Mike Pesco of Georgia State University. Dr. West will be presenting his research in two segments. We'll have a pause after each segment to allow for questions. Dr. West, thank you for present, presenting for us today. Thank you, and thank you very much for inviting me. I shall now uh, share my screen uh, so that we can get the slideshow going. Uh, so I hope you can see this title slide. Yeah, the a subject very dear to my heart. Um, I've done quite a few randomized trials over the years and also found myself um, variously impressed and frustrated by uh, reports of randomized trials of different sorts over the years. And um, so what I wanted to do in this uh, session was to go through some of the key issues uh, that I think have emerged in that process. And um, a major part of this talk um, actually comes from a paper that I don't think is quite out yet, but um, I will give the uh, link to the organizers as soon as I have it, um, which I did with uh, Daniel Cox, um, at, at, which actually examines many of these issues. My statement of competing interests is here. Um, I haven't done any um, consultancy or research for a few years now, but I have previously done research and consultancy for companies that manufacture smoking cessation medications, uh, most recently Pfizer with uh, Varenicline. Um, uh, uh, a more direct conflict of interest, although not a financial one, since I actually give money to it rather than it giving money to me, um, is the paper authoring tool, which I'm going to talk about in the presentation, which is my uh, last probably major uh, uh, sort of labor of love um, in my uh, career, I guess, um, because it'll probably last uh, forever uh, in terms of the work. Um, and in terms of values, uh, if we're going to talk about values as conflicts of interest, which I think is reasonable, uh, my, my main ones are about the things that really get me going are about maximizing well-being and particularly addressing issues of uh, subjectivity uh, in public health and behavioral science. Right, so uh, what I'm gonna cover are, uh, these are the topics, uh, randomized controlled trials, what are they good for? Um, a reference to a song that uh, some of you may remember. Um, and if you don't, then the joke is lost on you, but you have to look it up. Um, uh, and then uh, go specifically into issues uh, around generalizing from randomized controlled trials, which uh, we often call external validity, inferring causality from randomized trials, which is what they're supposed to be really good at, which is internal validity, and then analyzing data from randomized trials, and then lastly, reporting. And then we'll take a break, uh, and then we'll go into what I think are 
uh, some key solutions to this, which are many of which are already um, begun, beginning to uh, be put into place, but there's an awful long way to go. So um, before we look at the first part of that, let's just remind ourselves about what the features are of a randomized controlled trial, because that will structure what I talk about later. Uh, with a randomized trial, you have a group of participants, P, um, which could be, for example, cigarette smokers willing to use cessation treatment, and you characterize those participants. They exist within a setting. Setting is very often neglected when we report or not accurate adequately reported in randomized trials, which is not only the current setting, but the historical setting um, for those participants and for the intervention itself. For example, family practices in the United States. So that's S, that's the location. Then you have your intervention, one or more interventions and one or more comparator groups. Often most randomized trials are two-armed, but they uh, could be uh, multi-armed randomized trials. Um, and uh, it's really important. One of the things that we often do badly is to properly specify the intervention. For example, if I do a study uh, in which I'm offering a treatment to someone, the study is of offering a treatment to someone. It is not a study of the treatment. To some, uh, so it is a study of the offer of treatment. Now, very often that can be the same thing if everyone takes it up. But as we see in the tobacco field, uh, very often it isn't the same thing. Um, and so it's really important to get that right. Um, and our comparator condition is often very hard to choose in a randomized controlled trial uh, because um, uh, you're sort of forced with a difficult decision around do you go for a, a, a comparator condition which is uh, kind of like um, next to nothing so that you could estimate the full effect size of the intervention or is it an active comparator so that you can if you can um, understand what the specific impact of, is of, of uh, a specific component of the intervention versus others. And that's a, that's a difficult choice. And one of the things that my colleague, Marine de Bruin, um, has uh, led on a study to investigate is how interventions and control conditions co-vary. And what we see in smoking trials is that the more intensive the intervention condition, the more intensive the control condition. So when we're trying to estimate, for example, the impact of intensity of tobacco treatment um, interventions, we can't do it directly. And Marine de Bruin has got a fantastic uh, program of work which is looking at that and has published many uh, papers from that. Um, and, but then not, not to be ignored is exposure, that's the E, um, because uh, in some cases, we many cases, we use intent to treat, um, but in some cases we don't. We use, for example, that uh, people actually attended the first session. In some cases, it may be uh, people who uh, used all of an intervention or were exposed to all of it, but that's really important to specify and may differ from intervention to control. And then finally, the outcome, um, which, which uh, varies as well. Tobacco research is really... Uh, pretty good compared with other areas of behavior change at um, identifying objectively or, or uh, objectively validated, even if not measured, um, outcomes which have clear, clearly defined parameters. But even so, uh, you get substantial variation, which is often not fully described in the uh, reports and not fully um, uh, accounted for in the evidence synthesis. Some of you who, if you're involved in, in Cochrane, may recognize the PICO, um, Population Intervention Comparator out, uh, Outcome, as the, uh, in terms of the PICO ontology. Uh, I'll mention ontologies a little bit later on, but Cochrane has been developing uh, a really important um, standard vocabulary and set of def definitions um, and relationships and ontology around um, interventions. And it provides quite a nice structure to look at this. But it, as you can see here, it's not complete because it doesn't uh, specifically in PICO cover exposure and setting, although those can be included in, in the other headings. Right, so what are RCTs good for? And the answer is not absolutely nothing, uh, as in the, the song. Um, it, they, are, it, it, they, they are an immensely valuable tool and we mustn't lose sight of that fact. They, they have a really important part to play in the research that we do. They're good for answering 
And I've, what I've done is highlight these uh, in blue, these things, because we're going to come back to those in terms of developing a checklist for assessing whether an RCT is appropriate in a given setting. They're good for answering simple comparative questions, is A better than B or A and B better than C, in a relevant context. Uh, that is to say, they can only answer the question in the context in which the randomized trial occurs. And if you want to generalize to another context, you're going to have to do some further inference. In addition, it has to be feasible to deliver interventions with sufficient fidelity. And it's not just with high fidelity, it's actually with fidelity of the kind that you would expect when whatever that intervention is, is rolled out into care. There's no use in doing a randomized trial in which um, when an intervention is delivered with perfect fidelity, um, uh, it comes to a conclusion and then, but there's no chance at all of that intervention being delivered with that fidelity. Then effectively, you're, you're answering a question that no one really wants the answer to. You're answering a sort of hypothetical question, not a real world question. And RCTs are very much about real world um, prediction. Um, they're feasible when you can recruit a relevant sample of sufficient size. Relevance is really key here, and I'm going to come back to that later because it's so important. Uh, sample size is really important. I, I recent, I'm not recently, many years ago, I, I uh, published a paper which was a very simple, make, making a very simple point. And it was just uh, looking at the benefits of smoking cessation. Uh, and what would be a clinically significant effect size for an intervention in terms of achieving smoking cessation? And you can really easily demonstrate that an effect size of around one percentage point would be highly clinically significant for many smoking cessation interventions, most of them. Um, but you can imagine that getting a sample of sufficient size to demonstrate a one percentage point, let's say from 20 to 21 percent or 10 to 11 percent um, difference, uh, would be all but impossible. And what that means is that we just have to accept that RCTs are only going to be relevant in situations where we can, where our question involves a larger effect than that, and, and we're going to have to use other methods to assess effects um, that involve samples that we just simply cannot get with RCTs, at least with the resources that people are likely to give us. Um, you need to maintain the purity of the interventions being compared. This is absolutely critical and very um, difficult very often in smoking cessation or tobacco use interventions. One of the reasons being that uh, people out there in the community have access to lots of other ways of stopping smoking. And if you're trying to investigate a particular method of stopping smoking, and let us say that the person is in the comparator condition um, and they're not doing very well, there's a great motivation on that person to go and find some other intervention. Of course, that is indeed what happens. So it's, it's a tremendous challenge maintaining the purity of the interventions being compared. You have to achieve sufficient follow-up, and we know in tobacco research that that is an enormous challenge for us. Um, in many other areas of clinical medicine, uh, if, if they were only able to follow up 70% of people, they would consider that a, a failure of the, uh, of the randomized trial. It just wouldn't be good enough. We consider ourselves pretty lucky if we can get a 70% follow-up, particularly for interventions, for example, that uh, involve things like um, smartphone apps and so on, where you don't have direct, necessary direct contact with patients. But achieving sufficient follow-up, and not just sufficient follow-up, but balanced follow-up across conditions is again a huge challenge. And that we can be confident that we can accurately, accurately measure relevant outcomes. Well, we can't measure relevant outcomes usually in our randomized trials in terms of health, because the health benefits from stopping smoking accrue many years later, and it's just not feasible to do that. There are some incredibly uh, good studies that are notable exceptions to that, including, of course, the lung health study. But that is something that, by and large, we wouldn't have the resources or time to be able to do. So we look at smoking cessation outcomes. But just to give you a sense of, um, what the limitations are of that. Um, you, you do a study, you've got an intervention, you find that, uh, that after a year, more people in your uh, intervention group 
have succeeded in stopping smoking than in the control group. And you go, great, that's fantastic. This, this intervention has worked. But what if it were the case that among the people who'd failed in that study, that more people in the intervention group then failed to go on to make a subsequent quit attempt or to succeed in that quit attempt? If you look over the longer term, then you may well find that the net health benefit of your intervention would have been wiped out or either mitigated or wiped out. So we have to be really careful when looking at our outcomes to be conscious that we're dealing with a larger system here. Um, and that, you know, very often it's a reasonable assumption to say, OK, if we can get smoking cessation up to six months or one year, that that will give us uh, a, a good marker of what the long term effects are likely to be. But we can't take it for granted. It's also incredibly important to remember that um, that smoking cessation is a, a really important outcome. But some of the harm outcomes that we've uh, heard about when looking at uh, the impact of certain treatments are not necessarily relevant outcomes. They are ones that might be markers of a clinical outcome later on, which may or may not then accrue uh, uh, in terms of uh, the negative effect. So that's what they're good for. And you can see that that's quite a tricky um, uh, list, list of things to, um, to check up on. So, okay, what are they not good for? Well, everything else. And um, that's the problem that, you know, there's lots of things that we want to do, lots of research questions that we want to answer for which we simply cannot uh, do an RCT that will answer that question. And if we try to do an RCT to answer that question, and if we try and convince people that we've done an RCT that answers that question, then we're not doing science and we're not doing public health any favors. Uh, we just either at the very uh, least, we've wasted a huge amount of resource. Uh, and at the worst, we've created um, a, uh, a biased and a, a false picture of what the situation is. But as I say, RCTs are a very, very powerful and important tool here. So. Let's just go through those uh, issues that I, I outlined right at the beginning in terms of uh, you know, the, the uh, internal and external validity of RCTs. And we'll start with the external validity. And I've broken this down into four categories, the interventions, the study sample, the context, and the outcome. And I'm just gonna go through these very, very briefly. I'm sure many of you, especially those of you who've done RCTs, uh, but many of you, when reading the reports of, RC, of, of RCTs, uh, much of this will be familiar, but perhaps not all of it. So the first thing when it comes to interventions is the fact that pretty much all of our interventions are what uh, they call in the MRC framework complex interventions. That's to say they've got multiple interlocking components to them. Even when we think they aren't, for example, we think we're testing a drug with a particular dosing regimen, they are still complex interventions because a drug just given to someone is not a treatment. A drug that is given to someone with a set of instructions, with, the, with a potential, potentially a certain amount of behavioral support and so on uh, with it, that is the intervention. And so even when we think we're doing simple interventions, we're very often doing com complex ones. And that complexity makes it potentially difficult to uh, answer this simple A versus B question. What it means is that we're very rarely in our, our, our RCTs answering uh, a pure question of, you know, is uh, nicotine replacement therapy better than Zyban, for example. Uh, we're asking, um, is this complex in this package of interventions that we're delivering here with all its complexities better than this package of interventions? The Second thing is the source of the intervention. This is a potentially important factor that influences the effectiveness of the intervention. So very often in our interventions, the person delivering the intervention, if it's a behavioral intervention, might be a researcher, they might be a MSC, uh, uh, someone who's got an MSC, they may, might be a practice nurse, uh, they can be a whole range of different uh, uh, professionals with different levels of training specifically for the RCT or background training. And we know this is not speculation. We know how important training is to the uh, outcomes in smoking cessation treatments. So 
um, the source is another factor, which means that we're going to have to be very careful about generalizing from our particular RCT out into uh, a world where that situation may be different. The purity of RCTs, it's a, it's, I, I wish I could find a better word for it. Someone, one of you may have a better word, but um, it's essentially the extent to which um, the, the intervention and the comparator are fully separated and they are what they are. So if, if someone is using uh, an e-cigarette, for example, and the intervention is about e-cigarettes and they're getting a particular behavioral support package, are they then also some of them using a nicotine replacement product? Are they then perhaps using a heat not burn product? Unlikely given that we're in, certainly in the UK where they're hardly ever used, but are they using some other thing, an app or something like that? And so, um, and vice versa. And we know, for example, from Peter Hayek's e-cigarette trial, that many of the people in the nicotine replacement therapy condition were uh, then started to use an e-cigarette. And you can't stop this because these are these are free agents. These are human beings, and and they're entitled to do what they uh, what they want to do for their own um, uh, for that for their own benefit. Um, the last two are distinguishable, though they're, they're often confused. Fidelity is a term that we typically use for the extent to which an intervention is delivered by whoever's delivering it as intended. Adherence is the extent to which the person receiving the intervention adheres to whatever the strictures of the intervention are. And do they take the tablets, for example? And again, what, what we see in tobacco is that both fidelity and adherence can be very different in the real world uh, out there in routine clinical care from how they were in, uh, an, in, in a randomized controlled trial. And that's obvious. We, we, we know that to be true, but we also know that that's an important factor and needs to be taken into consideration. Moving across to study sample, very obviously, um, people who take part in randomized controlled trials are volunteers. By and large, if it's a cluster randomized controlled trial, they may not be volunteers. The volunteers may be the people in charge of the clusters. But uh, in most of our randomized trials, they're volunteers. Now, what does that mean? That means that they have to be um, okay with the idea of being randomized from one group to either one group or another. And this places particular challenges and sometimes insuperable challenges on the person running the trial because. Um, do you want to be in a situation where you restrict the external validity of your study because you make sure you tell people everything, you, give, you do all the consenting and, and everything else, you get people into, uh, uh, you only get people into the trial once you've, you've confirmed that they're definitely okay with getting A or B, or do you do try and get the biggest sample you can and consent as many people as you can on the knowledge that um, you know, some of them will get uh, the intervention, some will get the control, and running the risk that once they know what they're in, they're going to pull out of the study, which will cause a, a bias and, and, and problems for internal validity. So it's, it's, a, it's a circle you've got to square. It's, it's uh, always difficult, um, and um, sometimes it works better than others. Uh, and retention, clearly. And that's a big issue for us. As, as, soon, as soon as you get uh, low retention, then you've got problems, not only uh, of external validities, but as we'll see of internal validity as well. Context, um, psychologists, social psychologists, particularly back in the 1960s and 70s, talked about what they call demand characteristics. This is the knowledge that you're in an experiment, that you're in a study. And what they found was that uh, people behave differently when they know they're in a study. And there's always a risk with that that would be the case here as well. The his, I mentioned previously that context is not just about the historical context, sorry, the current context, it's also about the history. What, is, what has gone on before in terms of uh, treatments that have been available to smokers, um, the tobacco control context and so on, that could influence the generalizability of results that are carried out in one context to a different historical context? Uh, so, for example, in the EAGLES trial, uh, we found of uh, varenicline nicotine replacement therapy, Zyban placebo, uh, we found that uh, the US uh, region had lower 
overall success rates than, than countries that uh, were, uh, were included in the trial from other, other parts of the world. And that was a, quite a big difference. One possible reason for that is the historical context that in the United States, uh, with, a, with a strong tobacco control history, and many of the people who'd be taking part in the study would have already experienced quite a considerable um, effort on the part of people around and norms and so on around uh, quitting smoking. And that may be different from in countries such as Japan and so on. And that's speculation. The fact is what it is. That was just, an, uh, that was just a, uh, a possible interpretation. And of course, the current context, what other interventions are going on? What other uh, policies are being put in place? What's going on in terms of the social structure in society? It's all sounding quite difficult. So, and, and I don't want, you know, I, I want to keep coming back to the fact that this does not invalidate RCTs. What it means is you have to uh, use judgment when interpreting the outcomes and decide and make a decision about whether you, how relevant you think a given RCT is to a, different, to a given context. And then finally, the outcome. Uh, are we measuring all the outcomes or the relevant outcomes that we that we need to measure uh, in terms of uh, are we being inclusive? So are, if we're looking at, for example, I know in the United States, um, certainly historically, there's been a, 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 um, a tendency to go for point prevalence abstinence rather than continuous abstinence from quit date or some period of time after quit date. Uh, that gives you overall higher quit rates, but it can also cause problems when you're generalizing uh, to situations where you really want to see whether the person, people are going to be continuing to be abstinent uh, long into the future and, and therefore get the health benefits. Are the outcomes um, going to be relevant to the re to real outcomes in the real world? And are there issues of measurement that are going to undermine the generalizability? So, so you know, there's a lot to consider. Uh, and I'm going quite quickly, but I'll, um, we'll be stopping fairly soon when I come to the solution, when we'll come to the solutions. Okay, internal validity. Well, randomized controlled trials are supposed to be our way of ensuring internal validity. That's why we do them, because we want, we want to have confidence that if, if I find in my randomized trial that this, this intervention is better than this one, that I can be confident that that is the case, at least in the randomized trial, even if I couldn't generalize to anything outside the randomized trial. I could at least be confident of that. Unfortunately, in almost all our randomized trials, that is not the case. And the reason is uh, uh, what we have here on the slide, and I'll go through it again. Intervention, study, sample, context, outcome. Randomization failure. Well, that can, that can happen. It's not, a, it's not a big issue very often, but where it happens, it's because um, the uh, it, it's, it's, it, I've, I've had it happen actually to a trial that I was involved in, uh, where even it was a relatively large trial, it was the case that um, people were being randomized into um, a particular condition at a particular time at a higher rate than to the other condition at that time. And so we were getting confounding of temporal uh, historical factors with the randomization process. There are ways of addressing that with the block randomization and so on, um, but it is something we have to uh, bear in mind. It can be the case, and very often in tobacco research, it is the case that interventions and comparators are delivered or, or are, ex, are ex, ex, the, 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 the participants are exposed to differential purity. What that means is, as I've alluded to earlier, particularly. If you're in a control condition and, and likely to fail, more likely to fail in quitting smoking, then you're more likely to look around for um, other things that can help you quit. Um, for example, if you're looking at apps, which are you know, terribly difficult RCTs to do um, on uh, smoke, smoking cessation apps, you know, there's loads of apps out there that you could go to. And if you're in a control condition with a, with a control app or even worse, no app at all, there's nothing to stop you going out and looking for other apps, some of them which may be quite good on the market. Um, you can get differential uptake, as I mentioned before. If someone finds themselves in a condition they don't want, then uh, they may um, not essentially go into that condition. They may not take up the intervention. Um, you can easily find that uh, when you have an intervention, a, a new sort of shiny new intervention that everyone's very excited about, uh, 
versus a boring old control, that the people delivering the intervention um, or the comparator have different levels of enthusiasm. So you're getting different levels of fidelity uh, and uh, other sort of attributes of the, uh, of the intervention in uh, the intervention versus comparator condition. And you can get different levels of adherence in the uh, comparator and um, intervention condition. Uh, blinding, as we know, in smoking cessation, mostly we can't do it um, because at least we can't do it for the participants, uh, because it, particularly if we're dealing with behavioral interventions, even with pharmacotherapies, uh, as John Hughes has uh, found years ago, uh, very often people can tell which uh, drug condition they're in because of the side effects. And there's nothing you can do about that. It's just what you it's just what you're uh, um, what you have. So, and of course you get differential attrition. Now this can work both ways. Um, you can, in, in apps, for example, Ron Borland has rightly pointed to a sort of um, an intervention fatigue or app fatigue where people in the intervention condition show more attrition than those in the control condition because they've just had enough. But you can also have it going the other way where in a con comparator condition, because you're not in such close contact or, or regular contact, with the person, with the participants, you can get more dropout in that. And differential attrition is a killer for randomized controlled trials. Um, context is obviously really important. And what you can have is different influences operating on the intervention and comparative conditions. This can be quite complex. And uh, it, 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 it really relates to the fact that all of these uh, randomized controlled trials are always embedded within uh, social clinical policy systems. And then finally, we have, uh, in terms of uh, internal validity, the issue we face with multiple outcomes. Rarely do we specify a single uh, primary outcome, that's it. Uh, we often want to sort of cast our net a bit wider for very good reasons. But what that means is that there is potential there for um, loss of internal validity by uh, selecting certain outcomes to pre uh, as preferable uh, to report and, and analyze than others. And then we've got measurement bias. So for example, if I'm in a study in which in order to get the uh, outcome data, um, I'm phoning up people and I put more effort into phoning up people in one condition than another, then that potentially can cause problems. Now, I'm not saying that all of these problems occur in all trials. They're all potential problems that can occur in any trial, and, and we have to be on the lookout for them when we're interpreting the results of those trials. And then um, issues with the analysis uh, arise in their legion. But I think the, the thing that I, I want to really point to here, most, most importantly, is that we now accept that we need to pre-register study protocols and so on. But I don't think we've quite cottoned on enough to the absolute critical importance, and this is not true just for randomized controlled trials, but for all these studies where there's, there's some degree of uh, latitude about the analysis. But it's really important to pre-register your precise statistical analysis plan, including all the ways in which you're recoding any variables, how you're classifying variables, and indeed provide the uh, the syntax for the analysis plan that you're then going to put the push the button on, and to do that before you've uh, analyzed uh, the data or you've you've uh, scrutinized the data or unblinded the data, because this is this is potentially a major issue in our field. Choice of outcome variables, um, choice of comparative statistic can be an issue. Um, for example, we we're used to using rate ratios. It used to be odds ratios. It tends to be rate ratios now, but that can be misleading. Because, um, for example, uh, for a higher comparator group success rate, you will get the same rate ratio for a larger risk difference. And it's the risk difference that gives you your number needed to treat and the, the clinical effectiveness of your intervention. So it can look as though, for example, NRT in the context of intensive interventions has a similar effect to NRT in the context of minimal interventions because the rate ratios are the same, but the, but the risk difference is not necessarily the same. Um, and so potentially you're missing out on a, a difference that would be important. So that's important. 
And finally, uh, your choice of statistical approach. And many of you will be aware that I've been trying to get as many people as possible to use Bayesian methods for this, because I won't go into the details, but Bayesian methods provide you with a more direct way of testing your hypothesis than our classical approaches. And then lastly, issues of, of reporting. And this is, this is a serious issue for us with um, incomplete information, uh, variably expressed, hard to find, incorrectly interpreted <laughs> and selectively uh, included. So before we go to the solutions, I will stop sharing and ask for any comments and discussion. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so maybe we can uh, turn it over to Mike Pesco to see if he has any questions at this point. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Um, uh, thanks so much, Robert. This is really, um, this is really interesting. Um, uh, so my read kind of of the literature is that there seems to be some, uh, some disagreement about uh, whether baseline characteristics uh, should be checked uh, uh, by arm um, with the consort guidelines recommending against uh, doing that. I was curious if, if you use that approach and if that's a sensible way to uh, check for internal validity. Yes, uh, in terms of the randomization. So essentially, has the randomization succeeded or failed? So um, my friend and colleague, John Stapleton, and I, I think I'm, I'm uh, reflecting his views uh, accurately, believes that the whole point about doing statistics is that you, you shouldn't have to do that because it, it is what it is. You used a random process to generate your two groups and then that and then you know you take your chances so so you don't bother my own view actually is that why would you throw away information that's going to be valuable to you potentially um, why would you necessarily rely on the fact that your randomization has created comparable groups when you can check to see whether it has done so so my view for what it's worth, and I do realize that, uh, as in so many areas of statistics, you know there, there's room for disagreement. My my view is that you analyze, you you check to see to the extent to which your randomization has produced two comparable groups. You analyze the data uh, as your in your primary analysis without adjustment. But if you find randomization has created a significant imbalance, you also, as a sensitivity analysis, do your uh, uh, analysis adjusting for baseline variables. Okay. Um, and do you follow any uh, rules of thumb in deciding what uh, the appropriate comparator intervention uh, should be? Um, you know, there's a lot of different tobacco products out on the market. And if we were going to do an RCT comparing e-cigarettes to all these different other products out there, right? Um, how, do, how do we choose which comparator we should use and what are the implications of uh, that decision? So, uh, yes, I think that, um, and the, tr the trouble is when you're seeking funding for this thing, uh, you'll, you'll find that your reviewers and uh, the board uh, take multiple views on this. And so one of the things to do is to try and find who's going to, you know, when you're getting the funding, which, who's going to take the the majority, you know, which is going to be the majority view, but but the rational approach is to say, what is my research question? Yeah, uh, to start with that, is is am I interested in trying to estimate the effect of uh, this package of interventions relative to um, what people would otherwise be mostly be doing, which may be nothing, or it may be some other kind using some other kind of intervention? If so then okay, you choose a very minimal uh, comparator. But then you rub up against the problem. You've got to get people to volunteer for your trial. And uh, are people going to volunteer for the trial if they may well be randomized to something which is basically nothing? So you're going to have to square a circle and it's always, always going to be a compromise. If, you know, th there's just no pure answer to it. Um, I mean, uh, if the question is, am I, am I trying to find out whether um, a particular active ingredient or set of active ingredients is making the difference in a trial, then, you, then you, what, what you want to do is you want your comparator to be as close as possible to the intervention as you can make it. So, for example, you know, I, I've been in, involved in work trying to get a randomized trial of e-cigarettes with nicotine in versus e-cigarettes without nicotine in. Um, for some time, and now you know trials are being done of that kind because I think it is genuinely interesting to see whether putting nicotine in e-cigarettes makes a difference or not. Um, I think it does, and in fact, the evidence suggests that it does. But 
um, you know, then you then you do that kind of randomized trial. But the, the point is that you can only answer one of those questions. You can't answer th them all. And, and, th and when people are trying to decide whether to fund your study, you're dependent on them agreeing with you that this is the one that you need to answer. Uh, yeah, that's that's interesting. I don't know if I've appreciated um, the, uh, I mean, one of your points was that the the comparator needs to at least be attractive enough to get people to join the the, the trial, right? And if and I guess that was going to be one of my questions. Why can't we just, do we need to have a comparator or could it just be be nothing? Um, I guess I, I would think the reason people would join trials is because they're getting paid well enough to do them, uh, at least in, in some cases, um, is that an approach around this in the sense that you wouldn't necessarily need a comparator if you just pay people enough to make sure they complete the trial, they join the trial, et cetera. Yeah, if you, if you put that in your grant application in the UK, you won't get funded. I'll tell you <laughs> that. You wouldn't get past the ethics committee. <laughs> We're not allowed okay. to pay people <laughs> to okay. take part in trials. Um, and uh, so, but, but people do take part in trials to benefit science, you know, that they, that they, they certainly do that. And there are all sorts of motivations. Yeah, there are, there are, there certainly are trials and I'm sort of tangentially involved in one at the moment where in a way um, it's, uh, people are, are quite happy about being the control condition because essentially from their point of view, all that's happening is they're taking part in a study in which you're following them up and they're in the control condition. And then in the act of intervention condition, you're also doing something. Now, um, you, know, you have to, people have to have informed consent. So they know what, they, they have to know what they're consenting to. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, it's, it is sometimes possible to square that circle, but often it's hard. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and one more question. Um, uh, uh, there's a tendency in smoking cessation trials to select uh, individuals who express a desire to quit. Um, how how do you view this decision in light of external and internal validity? It depends. And, so, on, sorry, Robert. Um, I, I, I'll just uh, add. There, there's one in the chat that uh, in the uh, Q and A that builds on that. Just asking how you would recruit people who have no intention to quit um, for trials with NRT, e-cigarettes, snooze. Um, yeah, I, it's a really good question. So I think the key here is again, it goes back to your research question. You always start with your research question. And your research question, which I'll, which I'll uh, show you a sort of framework for putting together in a minute, um, has to include what is the nature of your, of your study, study sample. If, you're, if you're, what you're interested in is uh, looking at uh, an intervention that helps people who really want to quit and are willing to make a quit date, that's what you do. If you want to recruit people, uh, uh, if you want to study the impact of an intervention on people who may or may not be interested in quitting, then that's what you, uh, you know, that's that's how you pitch your uh, um, your promotion for the study, and people will still potentially take part. The trouble with smoking cessation studies, as has been discovered, is that when when you um, when, even when you pitch the study as one in which we're just interested in smokers who may be interested in reducing or may be interested in quitting uh, or may not be interested in anything in particular. We just want smokers, right? What you get are mainly smokers who want to quit. And this is why it's really important when you're uh, reporting studies like this, not only to report your inclusion characteristics, but to, but to report on the characteristics of the sample you ended up with. Because you, be, oh, I've seen this before. People say, well, we're, this was a study of non-motivated smokers. No, it wasn't. You, you recruited people saying, um, we're not interested in whether you're motivated or not. That was your intention. But actually, the people you got were motivated smokers. So, it, no, it's, it, so, it's, so the points are basically, it depends on the research question. It is, it is possible to recruit people who are not motivated to quit. But you have to check. Um, and when you come to report the study findings, you have to report the study sample you've got, not the study sample you intended to get. Okay, why, why don't we uh, continue with the solutions? Right, okay, let me share my screen again, and we will see how we uh, solve these problems. Okay, so uh, five basic approaches to the solutions and there's not much there's not really time to go into these in great detail but I'm just going to show them to you and uh, if anyone's interested by all means follow up with me afterwards. Uh, 
The first one is uh, to set your research a question framework and make sure that your research question follows a, uh, a, a well-formed pattern. Now, the reason I say this is that uh, even with studies published in New England Journal, Lancet, um, JAMA, and so on, um, rarely do you see the research question formed in the way that it really needs to be formed. It's not just about does NRT help with smoking cessation? That is not a research question. That is a general aim of the, of the study. The research question has to include all these pieces of the um, SPICEO framework, PICO with s &E framework. What is the effect of intervention or interventions versus comparator among specify your population in specify the setting settings on you specify your outcomes and with the exposure that you're dealing with? That's a fully formed research question. Now, in the in your abstract, you may want to um, abbreviate that for the sake of conciseness, but ultimately that's what your study is looking at. And that's, so, so a well-formed research question is, is a good starting point. Second thing is the RCT appropriateness checklist, which is version one, which I have developed for the express purpose of this talk, <laughs> using those uh, uh, criteria that I set out right at the beginning for when can RCTs give you valuable information. And the first thing, is it valuable to answer a simple comparative question? In other words, does, is it really helpful to say, is A better than B, or is it more complex than that? Is it, uh, you know, if your question is about what is it about A uh, that may be better than something about B, or what are, the, what are the ingredients of an effective intervention, then that's a whole other thing. And this is actually a point to uh, give a shout out to Linda Collins and her MOST framework. If you're not familiar with, with Linda Collins, probably most of you are, but, and her, and her multi-phasic optimization strategy framework, that is a strategy for answering more complex questions, which would then ultimately potentially lead to an RCT. Is it feasible to set up the relevant context? Can you do, can you do the study in a way in which the context will be genuinely re relevant and generalizable to the situation you want to uh, generalize to. And then of course, is it feasible to deliver the intervention comparators with a level of fidelity, fidelity that's gonna match what will happen in the real world? Um, is it feasible, feasible to recruit the kind of sample that you want to recruit uh, of sufficient size uh, for, the, for the effect that you're um, expecting or you think would be meaningful? to maintain the purity of the interventions being compared, uh, to achieve sufficient and balanced follow-up, to measure all the relevant outcomes, and to achieve accurate measurement in intervention comparative, comparative groups. And if the answer to all those questions is yes, in some form, then you're in business. And then you've decided you're going to do a randomized control trial, and you have potentially a long list of mitigations that you, uh, that you could use to help you to ensure First of all, that you minimize the uh, challenges to external and internal validity, but equally importantly, that you collect the information that will, is needed to help someone who's reading your study tell them whether you have adequately met those challenges or how far you've managed to do that. So as I said, pre-register full protocol and analysis plan. You don't have to do the analysis plan at the beginning of the study, but you do have to do it before the analysis. Minimize randomization failure using techniques that um, are described in Daniel Cox's in my article. Um, assess and adjust for randomization failure. Minimize and assess setting relevance. And I won't go through this list because it's too long and boring. Uh, but you know you can read this at your leisure. But there's a, a long list of things that you can do. Uh, uh, by the way, one of them I think is really really important, and that, and that is undertake sensitivity analysis under widely varying missing value assumptions. Um, we've tended to use the missing equals smoking uh, missing value assumption, and that's worked quite well in the past uh, when we've had clinics, face-to-face -face clinics, and we could be reasonably confident that if someone refuses to take our calls, it's because they have gone back to smoking. That is not the case anymore, especially with, um, with interventions that uh, are distance interventions like apps. So we really need to look at other missing value assumptions and see whether those assumptions make a difference to our findings.
And then there's um, some of you will be aware, but if you're not, then do try this out. I, I and colleagues um, are developing, and we have a working version of it, uh, a paper authoring tool, which is just paperauthoringtool.com, to help you with all of these challenges that you face. So if it, it, you know, I would use the paper authoring tool when you're developing the protocol for writing for the RCT, as well as writing it up. But you can also use the um, paper authoring tool for particular components, for example, specifying your intervention, making sh it's like a it's like a checklist for pilots. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you've taken off in a plane, you still use a checklist because um, it's not really feasible every time to remember all the things that you need to do. And this really aims to make it as easy as possible for you. And we're developing this tool uh, all the time. Every day, we're adding functionality and components to it to make it easier to use and, and more helpful in, in your work. And then lastly, triangulation. This is a a, a point that Marcus Manafa has made, and I, and I think it's absolutely critical. And that is that um, uh, if you've got RCTs uh, giving you one answer, if possible, you also want to find other sources of information with different sources of bias, different ways in which the results might have been influenced um, to see whether they come to the same conclusion. And that includes things like individual level comparative studies, uh, in large surveys, for example, or prospective studies, and population level ones looking at trends in populations over time as they co-vary with uh, input measures. And, and that's something that uh, the group at UCL have done quite successfully uh, in the UK in looking at the impact of e-cigarettes on various parameters such as quit success, uh, quit attempts, and uh, smoking reduction. And what you can do is you can say, well, if they're all pointing to a similar sort of effect size, that gives you more confidence that that effect size is genuine than if they're pointing in the different directions. So these are the conclusions. Um, I'll just leave you to read those, but I, while I talk about the thing in the box, and this is really critical. All studies have limitations. All RCTs have limitations, all uh, uh, prospective studies, all studies have limitations. What we don't do ourselves or anyone any favors if we take those limitations and we consider them to be drop dead features when they're studies that come out with answers that we don't agree with. But we forgive those limitations when they're studies that we ourselves happen to think uh, pr produce conclusions that are correct. We must always try and be humble and reflective with our own work and as critical of that work as we would be of other people's work, but also be as forgiving of other people's work as we should be of our own work in the sense that we are not creating 100% certain facts. We're creating um, beliefs with a certain level of probability. And that level of probability goes up and down as information is accumulated. And our job is to have not only the right beliefs, but also the right confidence in those beliefs, whether it's whether it's strong confidence or weak confidence, it's all useful in public health. And on that, I will uh, stop sharing. Great. Um, Mike, do you have any questions at this stage? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, thanks again, uh, uh, Robert. Um, so I'm kind of curious to hear your take a little bit on um, a natural experiments. And so I'm, I'm a, a health economist. And so that would be the, the type of you know, evaluation um, uh, that I do that uh, I think I think it does kind of it tries to lean on some of the nice features of the randomized control trial uh, a, a type of framework uh, uh, right and, and so I'm curious how kind of close to a causal type of relationship these studies can get in your mind. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, if, if we were interested in uh, the effect of like e-cigarette flavors, for example, um, uh, one might uh, one might imagine doing a study in which, um, we take advantage of different states and different uh, cities in the United States have passed restrictions on uh, the types of flavors that can be um, that can be available uh, in e-cigarettes. And so using that as kind of the intervention then, right, whereas the rest of the country has all access to all flavors uh, to study, you know, its effect on uh, e-cigarette use, its, its effect on, on cigarette use. Um, trying to do like some checks uh, to assess policy endogeneity, for example, 
how close to a, um, a, a causal type of uh, relationship do those types of studies get in, in your mind? I, I think that when, um, when the data are good, when the data are strong, and you know, when you can deal statistically with potential confounders pretty well, and you're confident that you've got a model uh, that reasonably well uh, uh, deals with, you know, predicts the outcomes, um, then I think they can be very powerful. And in cases like the one that you mentioned, I actually, you know, well, I, th I think they're probably the best because I think that um, the, the limitations of randomized trials makes it terribly difficult to answer that, that ecological question that you really want to know the answers to about what would happen in the real world. Um, so, um, but at the same time, I think, you know, as with randomized trials, you always have to put a caveat on it. So you can say this was a natural experiment and then people can make their own judgment. I, I would say, um, you know, if you did that uh, and uh, you know, the results can look very powerful. And we've seen this with uh, looking at, for example, I do quite a lot of work now on COVID, um, doing some work for the UK government. And, um, uh, and you can see that, uh, for example, with mask wearing, really interesting data where we've gone, I think, from a position where early in the pandemic, um, the data were actually quite equivocal on whether masks on balance were a net benefit or a net uh, uh, or, or not. And, and now I think the evidence is really strong, not least from natural experiments. For, uh, there was one really good one carried out in Germany. So yeah, I think natural experiments have a really important role to play and sometimes are the only way that you can get an answer to the question you want. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, this is kind of a, 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 a real off the wall uh, a question, but I, I was curious if you have any thoughts on um, a policy experiments uh, in particular. And um, it, uh, for ex in the United States, there have been some examples of policy experiments, not with tobacco, but in other contexts, for example, um, the Oregon health insurance experiment in which different people were randomized receiving Medicaid or not. Um, uh, I know that the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, they have put money into different rural communities, uh, some more than others. Would there be any role for um, tobacco regulators uh, to use uh, policy experiments to uh, assess questions that have, there's no, been lo no laws passed on, such as you know, the effect of nicotine concentration, e-cigarettes, um, uh, that kind of thing? In theory, I, I think there is, and I think in the United States, uh, with all the different uh, states, uh, you're in a, in, a, in a unique position, really, to be able to potentially do that kind of experiment. Um, uh, I think that, um, you know, more commonly, you find yourself doing natural experiments where you didn't get mm -hmm. to choose which of the states did it, but you can, mm -hmm. I, I, there was a study, I can't remember what it was about, but it was in tobacco, and where, where um, states were randomized, and I think that's Gosh. pretty cool. Um, so, uh, yeah, absolutely, there's a role for it. Um, I mean, an example of um, sort of a, a natural experiment in the UK was the London Stop Smoking Programme, which we recently produced data on, um, uh, where you can, you know, you do something in one city, you don't do it in another, <coughs> or in the rest of the country, and you do an interrupted time series and comparator, and I think can get some quite powerful findings from that. But yeah, policy experiments would be great. They, in other areas, they can do them relatively easily where, uh, you know, for example, the Behavioral Insights team in the UK carries out these, exper these sort of experiments the whole time, uh, but they're on short term outcomes and, and they can, they can, and they're interested in often really small effects because they can still be very cost effective, for example, in getting people to pay their taxes. So I, I think with the last uh, couple of minutes, maybe we'll turn to some audience questions. One is from Christopher Russell. What do you recommend as the minimum duration of participant follow-up follow -up in order to reliably conclude that the behavior change observed is a sustained or long-term behavior change? So in the case of uh, tobacco use cessation, I think it's six months. Um, and the reason I, I'm sounding very definite on that, I, I, I often sound more definite than I am. Uh, but I'll start definite and then I'll maybe roll back on it. But I, the reason I say that is that um, there are potentially interventions that uh, if, you, if you go in too early with your evaluation too soon after it, you won't pick up the full effect of the intervention because it, it, some of it might have a delayed effect. But also we know, uh, you know that there is this very steep, largely exponential relapse curve, um, but it may have a different shape with different interventions. So you may, you may have an intervention that does you know, really well and then you know, falls off a cliff 
Um, you need to know that. So, but by and large, um, for the interventions we've got, if you can follow people out with continuous abstinence or something like that for six months, you can you can actually then plot the uh, the shape of the curve, and I think make uh, uh, pretty accurate projections going forward, which is what you need to do to, for the health benefits. Great. And so maybe one last question. Um, uh, Ken Warner says that outcomes in everyday practice, effectiveness, that is, uh, frequently uh, diverge from uh, efficacy measures in clinical trials. Um, NRT in trials versus NRT bought over the counter is a good example. And uh, he's wondering if there are clinical trials designed to try to emulate what outcomes will look like in everyday, everyday practice. Are there any good examples with regard to smoking cessation? Um. Yeah, it's a really, really good point. And NRT is a, is a classic uh, case in point. Um, uh, so uh, the, the difficult, not pharma trials. Are, <laughs> and the reason that it, for that is that you cannot persuade pharma pharmaceutical companies not to sort of stick their oar in constantly following people up, uh, which is in effect a sort of intervention for very good reasons, because you know, they have to look after safety as well as efficacy. Um, but you can do it with other sorts of interventions, sort of minimal interventions, you know, GP, uh, uh, GP advice, that sort of thing. And potentially you can do that with uh, text messaging and apps and, and that kind of thing. And I think so, for example, well, actually, the, the nearest we got to it in a pharma trial, I think, was our cytosine trial, um, which we published in 2011, where we deliberately sort of it, because it wasn't pharma funded, it was an independent trial that used cytosine, um, so in pharma, you know, pharmaceutical companies had absolutely nothing to do with it, then, and the ethics committee were okay with it. We, you know, they let us leave people alone until we got to the um, outcome point uh, where we wanted to uh, find their primary outcome. But also, um, they were just in, in um, uh, Vitol Satonsky's uh, smoking cessation clinic they'd been running for years. And the only difference between what we did in the trial and what they did in the clinic, apart from having somewhat more rigorous follow-up, was give half the people in the clinic placebo. So otherwise it was just the same clinic. So it can be done, but not, not when pharmaceutical companies are funding it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Great. C, do you want to take us out? Thank you. Uh, we're out of time. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 124 people for your participation. Have a top-notch weekend. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much.